Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. this season is having more fun than a knot top at a pale horse concert. They're telling a fun story, taking a victory lap through MCU history, and giving us lots of Marvel Easter eggs and connections. And I'm also going to talk about why this season is violating the rules of time travel that were established in Avengers Endgame. Time travel! The 1970s intro is very 70s, borrowing heavily from the Wonder Woman TV show and The Electric Company, which featured Spider-Man. Today's episode, Spidey meets the Spoiler. Watching this made me realize I really miss TV intros. Do you have a favorite TV intro? Tell me in the comments. Mine was the A-Team. I also love May's arc this season, where she becomes an empath. The woman who's always buried her feelings is now forced to experience the emotions of others. The coasters and the speakeasy use the old S.H.I.E.L.D. logo, which maybe Carol had a good point. Does uh, announcing your identity on clothing help with the covert part of your job? The beer in the bar is Bendiri English Ale, which Agent Hunter always drank in the past. The beer was named after Benjamin Deary, a friend of actor Nick Blood. At first, I thought Deke Starsky and Hutch tracksuit was an undercover outfit, but it has the new S.H.I.E.L.D. logo, meaning that this is just his ugly tracksuit. Sorry, Easter eggs. Gideon Malick returns. The future Hydra leader was on the World Security Council on the Avengers and was the baddie in Season 3 of Agents. Here he's being played by Cameron Pilatus, who also played him in the flashbacks during Season 3. They note that his brother Nathaniel is still alive. Now, in the normal MCU timeline, Gideon betrayed his brother and sent him to be devoured by Maveth on another planet. Daisy tells him, Don't worry, I'll pay you back later. And she's referring to this moment in the future. This episode ties heavily into the Winter Soldier when Hydra launched Project Insight using helicarriers. Except now, Hydra is going to launch them from the lighthouse base that was seen in past seasons of Agents. Both facilities are even kept in underwater bases that open dramatically before launch. When Daisy hacks into Insight, the tech looks very much like the computers that kept Arnim Zola's consciousness alive beneath Camp Lehigh. Zola died in 1972 and this episode takes place in 73, so it's possible that he completed the algorithm before his death. Although Winter Soldier implies that AI Zola actually finished the algorithm. Now, I think it's likely the Chromacons helped Zola finish it before his death. There's only one way Hydra could have gotten names from the future. So let's check out the names on this screen. Now, Daisy points out Bruce Banner, which is also a nod to the 1970s Hulk TV show. Man, primetime in the 70s was filled with sci-fi. Twas a golden age. Then we have Conrad Murphy, a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent from the Secret Warriors comics, Victoria Hand, who was killed by Grant Ward in season one, Ben Harris could be Agent Harris. Harris. Roberto Gonzalez was Edward James Olmos's character. Margaret Nelson was an actress in the 70s, and Betty Wright was a soul singer who died in April of this year. So this is a nice tribute to her. Or maybe, stay with me here, maybe Margaret Nelson is actually the married name of Margaret Peggy Carter. Well, we found a dossier of mostly S.H.I.E.L.D. assets, Bruce Banner, Nick Fury. Peggy Carter. Because in another timeline, pre-Avengers Endgame, she married someone who wasn't Steve. He saved over a thousand men, including the man who would uh, who would become my husband, as it turned out. I mean, it's confusing because the screenwriters say that this husband was actually Steve and the directors say that it wasn't. I'm going to explain MCU time travel at the end of this video. David Robinson was a staff officer in the Navy before going on a somewhat successful career in the NBA, winning only two championships. Nisa La Amador could be the mother of Agent Aquila Amador. Hydra, through Project Centipede, implanted her with the bionic eye in season one. Michael Phillips, aka the mercenary named Ice who appeared in the Punisher comics. Roger Stewart could be the great-grandfather of Coy Stewart or Flint. Now this would make sense because Flint is an inhuman so his ancestor would be an Inhuman as well. And by the way, what's up with Yo-Yo Speed? I bet all the Inhumans lose their powers at the end of the season to make room for mutants in the MCU. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Jim Morita was one of Captain America's Howling Commandos, and his grandson is Peter Parker's high school principal. There's also Robert Moore, the studio executive who oversaw the ad campaigns for most of Marvel's Phase 1 films. Thomas Hall could be a relation to Franklin Hall, the scientist who discovered Gravitonium in Season 1. And finally, Leonard Torres. I have no idea who he is. If you do, let me know in the comments. When Sousa sees Daisy's powers, he says, Guessing you don't really carry a piece, do you, seeing as you got that super serum powers? Because the only superhumans he's ever heard of were Steve Rogers and the Red Skull, who were both given super soldier serum. Wilfred Malik hints that Coulson is leaking information to his team. Now remember, Coulson is an LMD built partly from Chromacon tech. So it makes sense if he was hacked during his fight in episode three. Enoch says, Come with me if you want to continue to exist. Which is the space robot version of this. Come with me if you want to live. Coulson loves Enoch's car. Remember, he loves classic cars like he babied Lola. Mm -hmm. 
digging these throwback uniforms. When they break into the lighthouse, they're wearing uniforms exactly like the original shield jumpsuits from the comics. The final tease name drops Daniel Whitehall. Now at this time, he was still in prison at the Rat, but he was advising the Malik brothers about the monolith. Nathaniel mentions, He had a theory about transferring enhanced abilities surgically. Remember, Whitehall did learn how to transfer an inhuman's abilities to himself to become young again. And that inhuman was Daisy's mother. So there's a chance the next episode we could see the return of Whitehall, Jai Yang, and please God, please, Mr. Hyde. There goes the feeling in my legs. <laughs> Damn good coffee. And hot. So now let's briefly discuss time travel. Simmons makes a point to say that she doesn't really know how it works and it's best to keep it vague. In Avengers Endgame, traveling through time did not change the timeline and you couldn't erase yourself from the past. Essentially, whenever the Avengers time traveled, they created a new branching reality. We did a whole video that explains this that you should really check out. Now, this is also true of how time travel works in the comics. Doctor Doom invented a time machine that creates an alternate reality every time it is used. So why is time travel different in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? Why is it even possible to alter the timeline? Well, in Endgame, time travel is achieved by using the Quantum Realm, but this is not how the Chromacons are time traveling. The Quantum Realm is a gateway to other realities. Doctor Strange even visits it briefly during his Kool-Aid acid test. So what if the Avengers weren't just traveling through time? They were also traveling to parallel dimensions that most closely resembled their own. And the Chromacons are using actual time travel that keeps everyone in this reality. I mean, it's all kind of moot because I'm pretty sure Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. doesn't even take place in the same reality as the MCU because no one ever mentions getting dusted by Thanos in five years going by, but whatever. But what do you guys think? Is Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. still in the MCU? Did you like the episode? Let me know in the comments below. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.